So without further ado, we're going to switch over. Um, we're going to switch over to insecticide spray timing. And uh, we have, uh, again, another one of uh, Dr. Jabor's students, Micah McCuller. We really appreciate your time, Micah. Um, and I'm just going to turn it over to those two to give an introduction. Micah is uh, one of our students with UW. And, and this is a collaborative project, if I understand correctly. But I'm not uh, going to go into that too much. I'm going to let them introduce it. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much, Jeremiah. So yeah, I'm just again going to give a really quick introduction. Um, Micah has been working with our group for a little over a year now, and we're so thrilled to have him. And I'm really excited for him to share his work with you. Um, I quickly wanted to just give you an overview on this project that his work is nested within. So I'm sharing my slide set really quickly. Um, we're collaborating with a group at Utah State um, led by Kimberly Hageman. And so I think just knowing that Dr. Hageman is in the region now is really exciting because she's an environmental chemist who's really interested in pesticide fate. And I think for those of us who are interested in anything having to do with pesticides, this is a really cool collaboration for us to be able to have. And so the project we're with her on that's funded by the USDA um, kind of alfalfa program is about developing an alfalfa insecticide management toolkit. Um, and so basically, this is a slide of Kim's from when she worked in citrus. So she worked in citrus before alfalfa, you know, she moved to Utah a couple of years ago. And the idea is that the chemists, right, they will, they will look at application of a certain product and then how long it remains on the leaves of the plant. Um, and so here you can see you have kind of this decay curve as the insecticide is lost, whether it's to volatiliz volatilization, some of it might be uptake, there's different mechanisms there. Um, and so they're, they've basically developed a model where you can enter in some of these factors and make a prediction on how long it's going to stick around. Um, and so it can vary. Here you can see again, this, this is an example. It varies with temperature. It can vary with wind speed, right? I think a lot about that in Wyoming, right? The different types of conditions that we might have in terms of how hot it is or how windy it is. Um, and so the idea is that that will affect how quickly this product decays. Um, and the idea is, and here's the blue dash line, the idea is when we're above this hypothetical line, it's going to be toxic against our pests. And when we dip below that, it's no longer effective. So you're gonna have these different windows of time in which your application is effective against the pest. And so Kim's team is testing four different insecticides commonly used in alfalfa. They're looking at how this decay curve happens under different conditions um, to optimize their model. They've got some other folks who are specifically looking at this toxicity piece. And so they're looking at what level do you need to be toxic against important pests, but also important beneficials? They're looking at, they're interested in seed production as well. So they're looking at how this affects leafcutter bees um, and how it affects some other beneficials. And so this is just to kind of say that this is a project that we're a part of, and we're not going to talk about the toolkit at all anymore today. Um, but if you're someone who is an applicator and works in alfalfa a lot, whether seed, hay, both, and you want to give us feedback, um, I would say in the next six to 12 months, we're going to be maybe developing some kind of small group efforts to just let people test out this tool and see what they think. Is it useful to you? Is it not? Et cetera. And so if you want to send a chat to me with your email or your contact info or send me an email or a phone number call, <laughs> Um, just let us know if you're interested in testing this out with us, because that'll be something coming in the future, and we really would love to have knowledgeable folks um, give us feedback on it. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, and really, it's my pleasure to introduce Micah. I'm going to let him further introduce himself, and he'll be able to share with you the specific projects he's been doing um, that kind of fit under this umbrella about uh, what makes these applications you know, effective. Awesome. Thank you, Renda. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quick. Awesome. So as Renda was saying, <clears throat> my name is uh, Micah McClure. Uh, I'm a graduate student uh, working under Renda um, in the plant sciences department here at the university. Uh, so I actually, my background, uh, I kind of come from uh, northwest Montana, uh, up in this town called Ronan. Uh, Huge valley, pretty good valley. Um, a lot of you know, alfalfa is one of the main, um, one of the main uh, 
crops grown in the area. It's a big uh, cattle industry also as well. Uh, a lot of other crops in the area. Um, so I got a you know, pretty good background in that, um, in that kind of area. And uh, after high school, I uh, got my associates over up in Powell, Wyoming. And then uh, now I'm down here in Laramie working on my, uh, working on my graduates. And uh, so for today, uh, we're gonna be looking at insecticide application timing on pests and beneficial insects in alfalfa. So more specifically about what I'm, we're gonna be going over today, um, I'm gonna introduce you guys to spray timing of alfalfa weevil, uh, which will kind of then lead to our beneficial insects and why we care about them, which will then lead us into our actual study of our early spray timing. And then I'm also gonna be talking about a greenhouse project I'm working on that's working with chemical mixtures. Um, and I'll kind of describe a little bit more what that is down the road here. So to start us off, um, we already know about alfalfa weevil. Judith did a great job of introducing us to them. Um, and this is a similar uh, figure that, we, that she showed. Um, it's a survey that was conducted across the state of Wyoming. Um, but what I'm looking at now is the insecticides. And as you can see, they're the most often used and 80% of the survey said that they're the most effective. So we're kind of, I'm kind of interested a little bit more in the insecticide application side of weevil management. And something that is happening here in the Intermountain West region is that some agricultural companies or co-ops are offering to spray their alfalfa weevil insecticides along with their herbicides to control weeds in alfalfa earlier in the season for a cheaper price. And by that, that means more just combining those two mixtures together rather than having to go over the field twice, once for the herbicide and then once again for the insecticide. And, and uh, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, this is happening usually before like at around when alfalfa is actually coming out of dormancy and this is usually when your annual broadleaves and some of your annual grasses like cheatgrass and then your broadleaves your uh, lambs quarters or something like that are starting to show up a little bit earlier before the alfalfa does and usually that's when you go in and spray so that's kind of the timing that we're kind of looking at and um, this image on the right is actually a local producer over in Goshen County over in the Lingle Torrington area who actually um has just kind of been trying it out. And at the close front of the camera or the picture here, um, you see this nice um, green lush alfalfa. And he said, uh, he claims that he sprayed this early uh, for, you know, with his insecticide for weevil control. And in the back where you, you see a kind of a distinct line and then it turns that grayish tinge, he said he didn't spray that at all. So you kind of see, start to see a little bit differences already. So we kind of, kind of want to look a little bit more deeper into what that is. And so, you know, what I ended up doing is I started collaborating and communicating with local agronomists and co-ops over in that area, over in Lingle and Torrington, trying to figure out what insecticide they're using. Um, and what we found out is they're using the pyrethroid. Um, which is the, the chemical class. And the active ingredient for that is Lambda Cihalothrin. Um, and our common name for that is Warrior II, as many of you might be familiar with. Um, now it is important to know that Warrior II, as I mentioned, is a pyrethroid, but that is a broad spectrum insecticide, which means it could have, it could have some effects on alternative insects as well, not just your alfalfa weed. So that's something that we're also looking at. So the insects that we are looking at for this study are our alfalfa pest, which is our alfalfa weevil. And then we're also looking at our clover root curculio, which is another weevil. Uh, we're looking at grasshoppers, aphids, and then the miridae family, which is our ligus slash plant bugs. So those are the other pests that we're looking at. And then we're also gonna be looking at our beneficial insects. Now this can be from predators all the way to our pollinators. Um, so what we got at the top there is our uh, damsel bug. Now this is an important predator for our ligus bugs. And I know there's a lot of interest um, in these predators and trying to control these ligus bugs. So that's something that we're kind of looking at. Then we're also looking at our wasps, which is our, you know, we got predatory wasps and then we got our parasitoids wasp, which you guys were introduced uh, in the last slides. Um, so we're also looking at the, um, those wasps and then we got our spiders 
and Our Lady beetles. And then we got our bees, which is you know important for pollination for alfalfa seed if you are growers working on growing alfalfa seed instead of hay. Um, so those are also important as well. So some of the questions that we're looking at though is if we spray insecticides at an earlier date than what your standard date usually is, what will the effect be on our major pest populations? And the same thing for beneficial insects. If we spray insecticides at an earlier date, what will the effect be on these beneficial insect groups compared to a standard spray date? So for the design of this study, um, we're, locating, we're locating our study at the University of Wyoming, CEREC, uh, which is our research station located uh, in Lingle, Wyoming. Um, we used a two acre block for the study and it's run over an overhead irrigation and our plots are 30 by 60 feet and they're set up in a complete randomized design. Um, and the figure on the right here um, is a pretty much a figure of the whole plot itself, the whole two acre plot. Um, as you can see, all the colored uh, blocks here are our treatments um, and our plots that we're using. Um, we got three different treatments that we're using for the study. We have an early spray, a standard spray, and a control. Now our early spray uh, was conducted on May 6th of 2020, and our standard spray was conducted on five on May 27th of 2020. And we get these dates, um, so I you know, was communicating with the local agronomists and collaborators in that area, and um, just kind of matching what they were doing in that area in terms of their early spray timing and their standard spray time. So we got a couple weeks difference in between that early and standard spray. Now, something that's important to know, as I'll kind of, it'll help explain something a little later on, is these buffer zones here. So these buffer zones um, are in between our plots here. So on the spray days, I cannot actually be in the plots um, just for safety reasons. And uh, so what I decided to do is get our base populations of our insects in these buffer zones. So that's what those zones are. And I basically have four different zones that I'm collecting these insects in and I'm just kind of randomizing my way through it. And uh, I'll explain a little bit more on that here in a bit. So for our insect sampling, I collected insects on the dates of May 6th, May 13th, May 22nd, May 27th, June 4th, and June 11th. Now for this, I use a sweep net conducting about 20, conduct, conducting 20 sweeps per plot. Now the economic thresholds for a sweep net has been declared uh, two to four larvae per sweep. And after collecting larvae in the net, I stuff them in a bag and I take them back for, to the lab for storage. So I, that way I can analyze the data later on. So, that leads us right into our, the, my, some of my results that I've collected. So this very first image here, it might look like a lot right, right away, but what it is, is our base population of insects on May 6th and on May 27th. Now this, this, remember, this is where that buffer zone comes into play. So none of these numbers are actually coming from any of the treatment plots. These are just coming from the buffer zones. And all I'm, I'm telling you right now is just what is in the field um, during these two dates. And it's gonna let us see kind of the increase of our pests. So as you can see, our aphids, pretty much every insect you know, pest in this uh, figure has an increase in population um, between May, May 6th and May 27th. Now, alfalfa weevil larvae was, uh, is that, that is a super significant difference as well. Um, and then there are a couple other, um, some big differences in there and everything like that. Um, but quickly moving on, um, if we have questions about any of that, we can go back. So we're going to actually, so this is actually looking at the beneficial side now, same deal, just in those buffer zones, um, just looking at our base populations. This is our beneficial insect populations. And as you can still see, we see a similar trend here where we just see an increase in our beneficial populations between May 6th and May 27th. So now we get to actually look at some of our treatments and see what the effects are on this. So in this figure here, we're looking at alfalfa weevil larvae 
on May or on June 4th of 2020. So we got our three treatments at the bottom here. We got our control treatment, our early spray treatment, and our standard treatment. Now our control treatment, these are the insect population, or this is the insect densities numbers that I collected on all five, um, all five plots on June 4th. And as you can see, there are numbers way above a thousand larvae per 20 sweeps, which is a lot to count and there's a lot. So there's that. <laughs> and then we go into our early and our standard treatment. Now this is where things get a little interesting. This figure shows that the early treatment suppresses our alfalfa weevil larvae similar to our standard treatment. So that kind of gives us a little information about what this early treatment is doing to our alfalfa weevil larvae. And kind of looking through some other figures as I was going through the data, uh, we found another interesting one uh, is this damsel bug for our beneficial insect. So what, we, uh, what this shows here is, you know, in our control, which is our no spray, we actually see, you know, some pretty variation in terms of our damsel bug numbers. Um, but however, our early spray treatment actually kind of shows a similar to our, to our no spray. We actually start to see some, you know, numbers that are ranging between around one all the way up to five damsel bugs per 20 sweeps. Um, now, the interesting thing is, is that our standard spray date, which was on May 27th, that actually decimated all of the damsel bugs, all of those predators that um, are important for uh, biocontrol. So that was something that was kind of interesting that we looked at. And I'm really looking forward to looking at this, uh, running a, another year of the study and to see if we see a similar trend in the next year coming along. So earlier, Judith introduced you to a damage score. Um, so basically I ran the same exact thing over this study um, damage scores ranging from a zero to five, zero being no visible sign of weevil damage, and then five being complete defoliation. And so what we're doing, what I looked at here was our, was looking at the damage scores on the dates of June 4th and June 11th. Now these two dates are both after the treatments, both treatments have been applied. So June 4th is a week after the standard treatment was applied, and then June 11th is two weeks after. And so what I did is I just go in the field and I uh, just estimate damage scores. And what we see here is an interesting trend that you know our control ranges from one on a damage score level all the way up to a three, which our, our three is about 50% defoliation, which is pretty important for, um, you know, if you're growing hay or even seed. Now, our early treatments are actually um, keep, stay at that same damage score as our standard treatment. So that's something that's really interesting. So now what we've seen is that our early spray treatment is, all, is not only suppressing our weevil damage, but it's also suppressing our damage score, which is pretty neat. So kind of wrapping up what this first year of study it was is that we, you know, we know we have, there is a difference between insect communities on those two spray dates. Just we, what we saw was just the difference in populations. And what we also see is that we see that suppression of alfalfa weevil from our early spray treatment and how it's pretty similar to our standard spray time. And what we also just saw was that our damsel bug numbers are actually similar to the control during that early spray treatment and that the standard spray treatment decimated them. And then what we, and then what that last slide there was just our, uh, you know, how our early spray and our standard spray reduces the damage of our alfalfa. So what is next? So first I wanna complete analyzing all of the data from our first year insect samples. I wanna look more into like more trends and more insects, um, looking for more patterns and stuff like that. So um, I'm gonna be looking more into that over the spring and getting some more data out of that. Um, this upcoming spring, I'm gonna be, we're gonna be conducting year two of this. So we got that coming up. And then I'm also, as I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna work, I'm working on a greenhouse experiment, working with insecticide and herbicide mixtures and their effects on alfalfa and the weeds of alfalfa. 
And the reason I was really curious about this is when I heard that there, um, some people are mixing that herbicide and insecticide together and applying it all in one go. I want to know a little bit more about why or how, like, how does that affect what we're the target pests of that area? And by pests, I mean the weeds. And what happens is when you mix a two pesticides together, there are certain things that can happen. There's different effects. You can get a synergism, an antagonism, and an additive effect. And what synergism is, is that basically the two effects of each insecticide can be amplified even further and can cause an even higher effect if you mix them together. Or you can get an antagonism effect, which means if you mix two insecticides together or two pesticides together, you can actually reduce the effect of it. And then additive is, is, is there's not, not really any change, but you just add them together and they do their do the same thing. Um, and then I'm also going to be, I'm, I'm hoping this uh, year we can actually do more local growers for this insecticide timing. So now I'm going to dive into a little bit more of this greenhouse experiment. So last fall, I, we were actually able to get this started and rolling. And you know, as I mentioned, just mentioned uh, this mixtures and everything like that. Um, these are all the different, uh, I already talked about all of these uh, different effects. So just kind of summarizing that up real quick. Uh, additive is the sum of the effect of the two pesticides. Synergism is the combined effect being greater than the sum. And then antagonism, uh, our effect is less effective, so. What the research question for this project is, um, I wanna know the effect of mixing these herbicides and these insecticides on alfalfa, cheatgrass, and lamb's quarters. Um, so that is what I'm looking at in terms of this greenhouse study. Now for the setup, we've got our three species, alfalfa, cheatgrass, and lamb's quarters. And we're using two herbicides for this study. We're using Roundup PowerMax, and we're also using Raptor. Um, and then we're also using two insecticides. We're using Laura's Band Advanced and we're using Warrior Two. Now for the herbicides, we're testing five different rates for herbicides. That way we can actually uh, determine, calculate, a bit, uh, calculate if there is an effect going on between these rates. Overall, there's 30 treatments in this study. Um, and due to some emergence, um, we have five reps of alfalfa Per, per treatment, we got five reps of cheatgrass, but we only got four reps of lamb's quarters for this treatment. And we are using this spray chamber in this uh, image here in turn in to spray for our, you know, mixtures and stuff like that. So for what I'm, the data that I'm collecting for this study, um, basically we, on our, after, like seven days after our treatments, I go in and I collected a visual damage on a scale of zero to 100%. And what that is, is just a visual, as you can kind of see here, you can start to see some damage to these uh, little plants here. So I did that visual damage on seven days, 14 days and 34 days after. Now on that 34 day after the treatment, um, I collected the visual damage and then I determined whether the plant was dead or alive. Um, that's just, and then I also collected um, above ground plant material. So I just snipped off the plants and dried them in oven for, ovens for 48 hours to, to collect the dry matter. Now, the study was uh, completed, but I don't have uh, any data to show you guys today. I'm still working on that. It's a complicated process calculating this stuff, um, but hopefully I can get that done soon and uh, we're actually getting ready to start round two of the study with even more replicates. So we're gonna have a lot of uh, a lot of cool data to show you guys down the road, hopefully. And with that, I would actually like to thank, yeah, that's a bit. So I'd like to thank my lab group, uh, Dr. Kniss's lab for helping with this greenhouse study. I'd like to thank the uh, research station over in Lingo at CEREC. Um, and then I'd like to thank my funding source. Now, if you guys have any questions, if you guys are a little bit more interested about this herbicide and insecticides, are there other, you know, are there any other herbicides that you guys would like to see? 
Um, if you have any other questions relating to the study or the greenhouse study or this uh, timing study, my email is here. Um, and then you can get a hold, also get a hold of us on Instagram at Weevil Warriors. Um, I threw this little picture in here. Um, this is a, if you guys are more curious about uh, more pests and uh, beneficial insects of alfalfa here in Wyoming, um, you can search this book up online and it's a pretty cool book about these pests and insects. And that would be it. Oh, great, Micah, thank you so much. Um, thank you for unsharing as well. All right, so we got a couple questions here in the Q&A box. Let me grab those up here for you. Uh, so Micah, the first question is from Scott. How did you decide the buffer width of the field trial? Oh, yeah, that's simple. So the buffer width is actually just the same exact size as the plots. So the plots were just you know set up 30 by 60 feet. And then there's just a 30 foot buffer in between those plots. And they basically they're just, it's, it's just another 30 by 60 foot plot that's just in between those two randomized place plots. Great. Our next question is uh, from a different Scott. Where were the alfalfa weevil at the early treatment date, primarily the overwintering adults becoming an active in the field? That's a great question. And that's something that's been really interesting um, and that we're, that I uh, wish I knew a little bit more about. Um, what we think might be happening, and I'm not saying this is actually what's happening, but what we think might be happening is when we spray this early treatment, we might be killing off the adults before they even lay their eggs. So that's something that might be happening, but we're not 100% sure. And I'm not quite sure if Renda's got something to say about it, but Maybe not, so. <laughs> so I'm over here trying to, in real time, look up your egg data because what's, what's so Micah also collected, um, he was every week also going out there and splitting stems to monitor eggs, which is really cool. Um, and so, so yeah, I, his answer is a great one. And I guess I hate to be a, like more to come, but I'll try to actually look it up right now. But um, he also has a really nice, timeline of when we're seeing egg laying happening too. So he'll have that in relation to the spray timing um, piece, which I think will help tease out that question a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, gosh, I was out there when we sprayed. There's not, there wasn't a lot out there. It was pretty, like we tried to even visually like, um, you know, it's pretty early in terms of insect activity. And so it's been kind of interesting to, to do that. Great. We have a uh, comment, I, I think is what it is in the, the chat box from Brian. I think May 6 may be too much growth to be good kill with herbicide. On most years, alfalfa will have too much growth to hide the weeds, etc. So uh, I'm not real sure on that one for Brian, if you want to clarify that in the chat for us. But um, in the field where you guys were just doing an insecticide application, and in the greenhouses when you were actually looking at the, the mixed rates, is that correct? Yes, just to clarify on this, what we did in the fields is just the insecticide. Now in the greenhouses, that is just based off of plant staging. And the alfalfa and the cheatgrass were actually at the appropriate stages for herbicide application. And that was also collaborated with our weed specialist here, uh, and Dr. Andrew Kness. So, Hopefully that cleared that clarified that up a little bit. And I think just to add for the field study, we did do that in collaboration with a weed scientist. And so that alfalfa where Micah did the field study, it was at the appropriate stage. And so I agree, depending on the spring, it could be quite a bit earlier, but we did it based on the plant stage. Um, and so I think we were on guard. Micah was on guard for like two months to make sure yeah. he didn't miss that window of time. So we had a, if I, if I remember right, we had a pretty hefty winter. So we had a lot, it was, it, it stayed colder for a lot longer. So I, if I remember right, the alfalfa didn't come out of dormancy for um, a little bit later into the spring. So for us anyways, so. Right, and that was down there at the Sarek Research Center, which is yeah. outside of Torrington Lingo between those two towns, correct? Yes. Great. Uh, so we have a comment in the Q&A box from Scott. Great research. Very valuable. Thank you. 
Uh, our next question is from Lonnie. Will the same plot area be used in consecutive years? In my experience, multiple years of control seems to work better. That's a great question. Um, we're actually gonna change up, I, I believe we're gonna change up the fields this year. Um, the issue with running with running the same study over the same field is you start to run into some historical effects. Um, so in terms of research that can kind of manipulate the data a little bit. So we want to start fresh into a, into a new field that way we're not having any historical um, effects on this data. That is interesting, though, I don't know if like Lonnie can say more but um, I think if you think that's important, and it's something we could maybe incorporate in the future. I mean, we do still have those fields accessible to us. And so we wanted to just do, like Micah said, a totally independent, like, okay, let's go to a different field and try again. Sure, to get my attention. If we see the same thing. Um, that was sort of our idea. But I think I am, I think if that's something you're, you think is important, it might be something we could incorporate, just to say. Great, yeah. So anybody, but Lonnie, if you can reach out and, and email or Micah and or uh, Rinda, or by all means, come uh, connect with me, Lonnie. I know who you are. So, uh, but be glad to connect you with you down there and all that. Okay, another question. Many of us use the same fields for for years. I've had some still producing for thirty years with good management. Um, so I think that. I think that speaks to how relevant that that potentially could be. Absolutely, that's that's really great to hear. And hopefully, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I really really would like to get into producer fields to do this study. You know, if there are other producers out there who are practicing this, that way we can uh, get some just different effects rather than just doing it at a station. But with COVID and everything going on, um, well, all we can do is hope to get out there. Great. Uh, any other comments, Rinda or Micah, before we go? I don't see any other questions here. Um, I guess I just will quickly say, you know, I think we're pretty excited about this project and it really builds on some of the work and the observations that people have been making right in, in southeastern Wyoming and seed systems in Colorado with some of um, Frank's early work and Frank will be speaking later today. Um, and so it is really interesting to broaden our lens and look not just at efficacy, but how it's affecting these other insects in the community. Um, and I do think that's where, you know, doing it at a larger scale is going to be interesting too, because sometimes with these smaller plots, things are moving in and out and it can be a little tricky, but I think it's really, we're really excited about, about the data so far and how this project is going. Um, and also super excited to do the mixture work, which is something Mike has added on, because I think I think that's an important contribution because I know we know a lot of people are doing mixtures and it can really affect how both parts are, whether they're effective or not. We got a quick question in the Q&A box uh, from Scott. Would you be interested in presenting to the Wyoming Hay and Forage Association? I mean, I already got the presentation ready, so I don't see why not. <laughs> I believe uh, Renda and I went to it last year too and she did her presentation now over in Lingle or no that was in Torrington but yeah um that would be great yeah if you um if you got my email in that last slide yeah that'd be great I'll just say throw it in the chat or the chat box as well Micah that'd be great another Perfect. question we have is from Bob do you see a difference in weevil populations in newer versus older stands of alfalfa I can take that one. Is that cool, Micah? We actually did yeah. do a study with that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, in our previous work, we did do some work in southeastern Wyoming where we sampled like 20 producer fields. And one of the things we tracked, and we did this in the Bighorn Basin as well. One of the things we did ask people was about stand age. Um, we did not see an effect of stand age on weevil density. Um, those fields, the average stand age was eight years. So there were some that were older and some that were younger. So we weren't in like super uh, long term stands. Um, but yeah, that was like, cause we thought stand age would matter. We haven't seen it to be, to, to make a difference. It seems like other things are more important. Great. Scott has a comment here. The economics of combining the weed and insecticide is an important and be a real advantage. So seeing your results, it is great that you're studying this. So 
Thank you, Scott. Thank you. That's great to know. Thank you. All right. Uh, Jenny, if you have a second, can you please promote Judith back up? Uh, we didn't catch a question and we have a little bit of time here and we'll try and catch that right by here before we go to break and switch over to our, our next presenter. And the question, and maybe uh, maybe just Rinda could answer it if, if Judith can't get up quick enough, but uh, the question, I got to find it again. I had it written down so I wouldn't lose it. So our question was, what type of harvest equipment has the biggest impact or mortality to larva during your early harvest? Did you track that at all? Do you have an idea? That is not something we really looked into. So I don't, yeah, I don't know a lot about that. What do you think, Renda? I mean, it's not something no. we've considered. Gosh, what a good question. So when we were planning this project, which is before Judith came on board, I went down this whole wormhole of trying to figure out different types of harvesters and different types of mowers and, you know, how they might like crush things differently and stuff like that. And I, I came out of it with not very many answers. And, and, but I do know that from talking to people, there is some really interesting, like you all know more than me about innovations and in harvesting technology. And so I would say if people are out there using some newer things where you think, hey, doing it this way might better, like, it's so physical control is sometimes it's really just crushing these things. If you think there's adaptations in terms of your equipment that are important, I would love to know about it. I would love to learn more because we're just using whatever the standard equipment is that Sarek has. Growers are using whatever they have, which could be variable. Um, but yeah, really, um, there's some stuff out there, but not a lot. And so I'm super open and curious if that might make a difference. If people want to share more, love it. <laughs> Great, oh, more <laughs> information the better, right? <laughs> I have one more thing to say, which is like, thank you for all the questions and comments. I think this is a really great community of people this morning. And I love that even though we're on Zoom, people are being really free to ask. And I really, really appreciate it. It's been really great. So thank you for all of you for that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yes. And I agree with you, Rinda. This is, this is actually going better than I, I thought it would. So this is fantastic. Um, thank you again, Micah, Judith, and Dr. Jabor. Uh, thank you.